month's wrap up of 2020. We will take a look at the EU agenda and some key regulatory and economic issues and their financial impacts. This webinar and this event is organized by the European American Chamber of Commerce, where Europeans and Americans connect to do business. My name is Yvonne Bendinger Rothschild. I'm the executive director of the EACC New York's office, and I will be a host today. And um, with that, I would like to hand over to Sasha Leske. He's a partner at the NOR, based here in New York, and he's the chair of our, the EACC's legal committee. And Sasha will set the stage for today's discussion. Sasha, over to you. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, as Yvonne mentioned, I'm, my name is Sasha Leski. I'm the head of NERS um, New York office. I would like to welcome all of you to our program. Um, good morning to our participants here in the US and good afternoon to those joining from Europe. We have a very exciting lineup for today as we intend to look ahead at the EU's agenda on important regulatory and economic matters and the impact we may see on the economy. Over the last several months, there have been numerous developments to the regulatory landscape across Europe and the US, which are bound to impact the global economy and as well as the uh, transatlantic uh, relations. Some of these developments are a response to or a consequence of COVID-19, such as the groundbreaking 857 billion EU recovery package or as a matter of fact, um, inevitable restructuring and insolvency situations affecting companies in Europe and the US, which will offer opportunities for distressed m &A and make it important to understand the key differences between insolvency proceedings in Europe and chapter 11 in the US. In addition, there are important developments unrelated to COVID-19, notably, a recent ruling on the EU-US privacy shield for the transfer of personal data, and of course, the Brexit. For the reminder of 2020 and into the coming year, we are sure to see challenges and opportunities across many industries. Our esteemed panelists will address these key topics and discuss how to best handle cross-border matters during these unprecedented times while navigating legal and financial obstacles across the two continents. I will now turn the program over to Yvonne Bendinger Rothschild, Executive Director of the Eastern European American Chamber of Commerce, who will serve as our moderator today. Yvonne. Thank you, Sasha. So um, our um, panel, quick introduction. We have Daniel Rücker. He's a partner at NORA based in uh, Germany and the head of their digital privacy practice. Um, Daniel specializes in information technology and data protection law, and in addition to handling complex data protection matters such as the structuring of international data flows, Daniel, um, Daniel's area of legal focus include IT compliance, e-commerce, IT outsourcing, and litigation. And we all have um, also on the panel Juan Oñate. He's a partner at Perez Lorca in Spain and he has spent his professional career in various national and international firms where he participated in the market's most significant insolvency and restructuring processes. He has extensive experience in negotiating um, structuring, restructuring agreements and in the purchase and recovery of non-performing loan portfolios. He also has um, um, defended clawback actions, director liability claims, and in relation to M&A in insolvency and insolvency situations. Um, we have Agnieszka um, Rafalka. She's a transaction counsel at Apollo Global Management here in New York. Apollo is a leading global and alternative investment manager. Prior to joining Apollo, Agnieszka was a corporate associate at Sullivan and Cromwell, where she advised clients on a broad range of transactions, ranging from financing through mergers and acquisitions and capital market activities. And we have Chris Orsini, he's the Council of Economic and Financial Affairs at the Delegation of the European Union, based in Washington. He's in charge of the US economic and um, economic policy developments, transatlantic economic relations, and the uh, 
between the EU and multinational financial institutions, mainly the IMF. Um, Chris, prior to joining the delegation, um, he worked in the um, European Commission Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs and in the Directorate for um, Fiscal and Macroeconomic um, Surveillance of Member States. And Chris, um, you are um, going to uh, um, start with our discussion today. Um, could you give us a, um, a quick introduction of the highlights what we're um, looking at? in terms of policy developments. Good morning, Yvonne. Good morning, uh, fellow panelists. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, sure, Let's, let us uh, start with that, maybe. Uh, as a, just a reminder that the European Commission published its uh, forecast uh, last week. Uh, I know maybe the attention here at this side of the pond was a bit elsewhere, so uh, maybe I thought I would I would just give a bit of a of a run up, um, you know, quick quick uh, uh, summary of that. Um, it's an assessment of where we stand, an assessment where we are going, and I think maybe this could be a good of a, a scene setter. Uh, I think it's fair to say that we are not where we were hoping to be uh, last summer when the last forecast came out. Uh, since then, a number of uh, um, risks that we had flagged have materialized, and that is most notably in terms of the uh, uh, second wave, and uh, which we are now is really hitting very hard the, the EU economies, which have been forced to reimpose some of the restrictions. Uh, and of course, a, a number of files are not necessarily moving or seem to be moving in the in the right directions. And and you know maybe we could have a chance to talk about Brexit uh, uh, as well later. Um, on the other hand, you know some of the data coming in were 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 very very positive, especially the developments in Q3 had surprised everyone on the upside, meaning that you know once you but of course, you reopen an economy after the shutdown, you can get a very quick, very quick rebound. Um, just to, uh, uh, you know, give a sense of this, that, the, the, you know, in the US, the Q3 growth was uh, 33.1 and the EU was 57.9. Uh, now, I really try not to talk about these annualized growth rates because I think they're in this kind of situation, they are really misleading and they don't tell you very much of, of what is going on. The, the best thing, uh, way, I think, to, to, to materialize, to, to sort of picture it, is, is to look at how, how we are now, what level of activity with respect to Q4 of 2019, which was sort of the last quarter that we had without, uh, without before COVID. Uh, and there we have that the, the EU, uh, the, the level of activity is about four, was about 4% lower in q3 than it was in in, in 2019 uh, and that compares very you know similarly to the 3.5 that is in, in the us uh, of course if you're going to look at throughout the year the overall contraction is going to be bigger in the eu because the output loss in second in the second quarter was just so much so much bigger but in terms of like you know on the rebound we we are at similar at similar um at similar level uh, now, of course, this is thanks to the unprecedented level of, uh, of stimulus that was, well, not stimulus really, of support that was given by monetary and fiscal authorities in the member states. And, uh, and this was really, uh, it's not stimulus, it was really sort of to help the economy bridge uh, this, uh, uh, the, the, the lockdowns and uh, it took the form of uh, uh, liquidity support for firms and we know many of those schemes to support employment, uh, uh, short work schemes, uh, the, the, the Kurzarbeit uh, that have uh, you know, uh, attracted also so much attention here that allowed to stabilize employment through this unprecedented, unprecedented time. Um, so member states put in huge resources, including the ECB, to bridge uh, this, uh, bridge us over. Um, and the EU, of course, at its, at its, at its uh, level, um, simplified uh, or, or made the framework possible through uh, a reform or a temporary framework for state aid. Uh, for state aid. And, uh, and also activating a generalist escape clause that would allow member states to use all of its, its fiscal powers. Um, but of course, I mean, now we are entering or we are will be entering at one point in a very difficult situation where all this blanket support that was given uh, to firms, uh, to uh, uh, households will need to be uh, withdrawn. Um, and, and of course, I mean, make no doubt about it, there will be, there will be bankruptcies. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, it will be interesting to see how also the new, uh, the new framework, uh, uh, legislative framework uh, will, have a, will play a role on this or not. And there will be an increase in unemployment. We have already seen this. Unemployment is creeping up. 
what we will not have is this big spike and coming down we will be you know converging towards uh, from the bottom uh, the, the 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 for the forecast of the commission is that the unemployment uh, rate will hit its maximum of 9.4 uh, next year and then progressively go down in 2022. So where are we with this, when we put it all together? Well, uh, growth, is, I mean, the contraction is supposed to um, estimate it at around 7.8 for the Euro area and 7.4 for the EU for this year. The rebound should be in the order of 4% for 2021 and 3% on 2022. And this, of course, it's, it's, it's conditional on a number of, of hypotheses re regarding the evolution of the pandemic and the restrictions that were put in, uh, put in place by government uh, that would be progressively lifted off throughout, the, uh, throughout next year. Um, but, you know, what also the forecast shows is, in fact, that another risk that we had highlighted before is materializing. And that is the risk of a very asymmetric impact uh, across our member states. Uh, this is because, um, you know, member states were differently exposed to this shock because of the structure of their economy and also because they had different um, firepower, if you want, to face uh, this, this uh, extreme downturn. And, uh, and this is really, you know, the, the risk, a key risk that the European Commission has been highlighting since the beginning is the risk of divergence within the, within the EU, um, which, uh, you know, it's, it's an economic risk, uh, first of all, because you have spillovers uh, if part of, your, of, of, of the union does not grow. But, you know, it's also a political risk. We have seen after in the aftermath of the, of the great financial crisis when, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the very delayed recovery of some of the member states uh, had also, uh, you know, uh, raised some, some questions about the whole benefits of the, of the membership and, or in the union, etc. So this is something that, um, you know, the, the commission was, was really determined to prevent uh, this unevenness in the recovery. And that is really the, the, the philosoph philosophy behind the, the recovery package. Uh, now, I said before that the, the, the intervention by the member states was to bridge. The, the idea of the recovery package is to transform. Uh, and uh, and uh, so, you know, if you, you, you can simplify it, you can look at the, the money that comes from the stand, member states was, was to just to take us over. And the money that is coming from the EU, from the federal level, is just to bring us to the next generation hence also the name next generation eu and that is where sort of the recovery from COVID goes hand in hand with the very deep transformations in the eu economy in the eu societies that you know uh, to face the challenges of digitalization of greening but also of aging that we have uh, discussed for so very long time so it is an Can I just jump in with a, with a quick question on this? So um, I attended a webinar yesterday where, um, where the concern was that um, none of the recovery package has been, um, none of the funds have been paid out yet. But um, I mean, that's exactly what you just said. We, we um, you know, we have the member state funding to bridge and now, um, you know, we have the, we have the rescue fund um, come in. Um, how do you think that is going? Is that already um, calculated into the cal um, into the 9.4 percent unemployment? Because that should counter help counteract the bankruptcies and the uh, the downturn of the economy. Yeah, Ivan, you make an excellent point. Uh, indeed, this is um, so. The way we do our our forecast at the European Commission is that we only take on board policies in the moment where they are sufficiently detailed so that we can know what kind of impact they're going to have on GDP. So uh, the way this, this next generation EU uh, and particularly the Recovery and Resilience Fund, which is the bulk of it, is going to be spent is, is actually a, a very different way from the way EU has implemented been implementing its budget before. This, if you want, is going to be a form of budget support that is going to give to member states once they have submitted their recovery and resilience plans. The recovery and resilience plans have to detail you know, very clearly what kind of investments, because the money will only be available as in for investment, and what kind of structural reform the member states are committing to do. And there will be a dialogue. And, and of course, there, this is the, the reason why this is being delayed. In a way, it was easier to extend that kind of support 
you know, to bridge us over uh, the, 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 the crisis with the, with the schemes that already existed. When we are talking, what we're talking about here is, is something that requires a level of planning, which is much more, uh, and, and, and transformation and re-identifying new areas and ways to support it that uh, requires a bit of work. So I think, you know, we, we have, of course, a bit of a delay on the legislative train, uh, if you want, that the, 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 the parliament and the council still have to come to a full agreement of the package. Uh, and I remember that this package was negotiated really as a package in the sense that we have the, the seven-year budget of the of the EU which is coming together with this exceptional uh, effort um, and and you know also requires some adjusting on the funding side and we can come back to that you know how the fact that the EU will be emitting debt for the first time to fund this package so it was a very complex uh, uh, package from the legislative point of view, but it's also a very complex package from the programming point of view for member states. So we expect that, you know, the member states will uh, submit, and as I said, this is not, it's a really a dialogue, and I think you know, it would be also interesting to hear them from other panelists of their perception about uh, where these plans are going, for example, in Spain, where they're going in Germany, because this is not, it's going to be tailor-made. It is, there's a strong national uh, ownership of this program, uh, but there will be also a process of negotiation with the European Union to make sure that they respect or that they fulfill or they go in the direction of addressing those challenges that I mentioned before. Yeah. So, Agnieszka, yeah. do you want to do you want to comment on that? Um, you know how um, how these investments are looked at, and um, you know what some of the challenges are and, and implications for U.S. investors. To give your oh, your uh, my uh, okay uh, yeah happy to uh, I mean I I echo what Chris said in that I'm sure the investment professionals at Apollo and other other uh, investment firms are looking at this uh, initiative keenly to determine what the what the next generation Europe will look like. I think what is what has been so striking about this um, about this uh, pandemic and the and the crisis is how how not just the disparate effects that Chris mentioned on the member states, but also on the on the various industries. Some industries have uh, re rebounded almost immediately after the initial weeks of shock, and some have even maybe gotten a little bit of a boost from from the stay at home uh, uh, orders. But others have been hit very very hard, and uh, I think it's also I mean. Uh, people who are much smarter on these things than I am have pointed out that in some ways this this crisis may be accelerating certain uh, trends that have already been happening in the background. And so I think to anyone who's looking for which trends are just uh, tra transient and are going to pass uh, with this crisis as soon as as soon as the crisis is o is over. And which are long sort of long-term trends that are really going to transform our our economy and our society. I think those people will definitely take a cue from from uh, from this package. The way the way it all allocates uh, a, a good chunk of the funds to initiatives that are green, um, I think definitely sends a message about which trends are are here to stay and which and uh, investors will definitely want to take another close look at their ESG policies, at their impact strategies, to see if there's a way that they can capitalize on, on, the, on the new green, green recovery. Um, and I think that, uh, that would definitely be the smart, the smart way to do it, to look at it. Yeah, yeah. It turned. For, it's it's really um, you know it, um, a funding package, but with a with a very strong focus on uh, um, policy. Uh, Daniel and Juan, um, do you want to comment in and and um, maybe Juan, do you want to start and then Daniel on uh, um, what the discussions are in in Germany and Spain on state aid, in particular. Yes, sure. Um... Uh, in Spain, as you know, uh, Spain is one of the countries uh, who's been more affected by the by this crisis, by the COVID. Um, according to the last forecasts, our GDP is going to go down 12 percent, and and we have already requested 70 billion, and we are uh, we have uh, requested an overall of 140 billion. 
um, in grants and loans. Um, I think the, the challenge, uh, of course, the amount is important, but the challenge we are facing is how to choose uh, and present to the European Commission uh, the, the right projects to achieve that transformation we are looking for. And, and uh, we have like two challenges. One is to present it to the European Commission in a way that is uh, convincing. And second, uh, to deal these, uh, with these funds regionally. Because as you know, we have 17 regions in Spain which uh, have some, some kind of autonomy. And we will have to also negotiate inside Spain how to distribute these funds. So it's going to be a, a, a challenging for everyone. And I, I hope we are, we are ready to, to do it properly. Yeah, Daniel? Okay, so um, you know, I'm not a I'm, I'm a data protection expert, not a finance expert. So I can just tell what my my partners are, partners are telling me. So of course, you know, we we also have um, you know quite uh, extensive support and and state aid measures, yeah, to support different kinds of companies. Uh, they were brought in force very very quick in a in a in a extremely broad scale as we as we have had it almost never before. And, um, you know, the key measures um, for most important ones for companies are, of course, um, you know, it was mentioned by Chris already before, um, the exemption from the obligation to apply for insolvency proceedings in case you would normally have to apply for. Uh, then, of course, very important um, are state loans. Yeah, we have a state-owned bank here in Germany, which is issuing these state loans, uh, which is, uh, you know, used by companies uh, quite extensively. Now, beyond that, we have, of course, public guarantees so that companies can get loans from their banks and they're guaranteed by the state. This is happening basically on a country level. And, of course, we also have the stabilization fund. This was uh, quite, quite a discussion um, in, in, in Germany also about that in context with Lufthansa. Yeah? Um, it's a, a basically... Um, 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 it, it supports companies who were, you know, hit very, very, very hard by, um, by the corona crisis like airlines. And um, of course, in 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 uh, in exchange for these uh, state aids, um, you know, the state um, gets gets shares in these companies, and so this is you know on a high level what is what is happening. And I think there's quite an interesting discussions. Uh, it's 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 nice to have these state aids and and support, but there's also a potential downside of the whole thing, yeah, because it's um, it's there's some restrictions. Uh, resulting from such aids, uh, there's a limitation on dividends, yeah, also bonuses, these kind of things. So the idea is that the state aids are not um, supposed to go directly to the shareholders, yeah, but to the company. And um, there's also some discussions um, up on how to exit from state aids again. So if a company, as a company, you applied for these state aids and then you found that it's not, it hasn't come so bad, and um, you want to get out of that and uh, also get out of these restrictions. And that's quite an interesting um, thing, I think, where, you know, we also support our clients. So maybe not, not completely expected, but a new aspect, I would say. Yeah, we have the same situation here with the with the rescue packages. Um, speaking of getting out, um, um, Chris, um, one one um, half a minute on Brexit, how Brexit ties into all of this. Well, Brexit ties into everything, of course. Um, I, I just maybe quite quite a reminder. We have, uh, in our in our forecast, uh, assumed that uh, it, that the, the the UK will be trading um, with the EU uh, on the basis of uh, most favoured nation, starting from uh, 2021 and 2022. So this is just a technical assumption, and it ref and uh, you know we needed to under underpin the forecast by a technical assumption. Uh, so it does not really uh, reflect the expectation on on either, but it, in a way it is a way it's at current policies. So to say, there is not sufficient progress uh, to to uh, to underpin a different a different scenario. At this stage, um, there is not really any any uh, provision in the next generation EU, uh, sorry, in the recovery and resilience facility for 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 this. But uh, the um, enhanced uh, uh, MFF, the EU budget, has foreseen additional funds that could be available for member states that are going to be particularly hit by a disruption of uh, of trade with the with the UK. Yeah. Uh, but you will foresee that I mean our 
our forecast for the moment for the for the for the UK is is quite uh, quite dire for this year, and also that the you know the pace of the rebound will be somewhat limited as a word. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Um, with that, Daniel, could you? Uh, um, I want to um, uh, make sure we get to cover all of our topics. Um, could you give us an overview of the uh, um, GDPR and the future of um, data protection developments in the EU? Yeah, absolutely. Um, happy to. So. Um, you know about the GDPR, everyone heard of it. It was uh, came in force in uh, May 20, 2018. And um, I think the first two years were about, you know, implementation. The authorities were mainly advising companies. There was not no real enforcement that, but that has changed since I would say the end of last year, pretty much. So, um, and also, um, you know, this is also, you know, what, what the data protection authorities actually say. Uh, they change from you know consulting company, companies um, to enforcing, and this is also what we saw in our practice that you know there was also quite a lot of enforcement action going on. We also you know supported several clients in 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 in, in fine proceedings, these kind of things. So uh, quite an interesting um, development. And um, yeah, what we can also say is that um, still many many companies, whether overseas or whether based in the EU are not sufficiently prepared and now are sort of hit by these kind of enforcement actions. So I'm, I'm just wondering, and Anjeshka, um, you know, what is what is your view on this from a US point, point of view? Is, is the GDPR an issue for companies in the US or do they have it on the screen or what's, what, what do you think? It's, it's definitely on the radar, uh, definitely very much so. Uh, and since the, I've been with my, uh, with Apollo for, close to three years now. And in the time uh, since I've joined, it really has, ex the focus has grown exponentially, I think. Um, mm. it, it, it definitely is on the radar. And the way it comes up for, in my practice, is definitely focused during diligence uh, in, in, for that precedes M&A, definitely mm. uh, the practices of, of companies that may be more Sort of customer facing and maybe processing a lot of uh, personally in, in that, uh, identifiable data definitely um, is something we look at and, and focus on. Mm, yeah, that's also our observation uh, from international. Yeah, without a question. Good. So, sh sh shall I say something about the U U.S. Privacy Shield? Um, I was I just that... going to yeah, I was just yeah. going to ask you if you could um, you know just give us a quick. Um, update on that absolutely so um I, I keep it try to keep it short so um you know as many of, of you are aware there was a, a decision of the european court of justice in, in mid of july this year and it was about the invalidation of the eu us privacy shield so um, many of you will know it others may not know it so what's the background um in um in the eu we with the gdpr the general data protection regulation uh, we have in the EU a sort of harmonized level of data protection. So, and um, there's some rules in the GDPR which say if you know a EU company exports personal data to a company in a third country outside the EU, then have to make sure that the recipient of these data, for example, in the US, provides for an adequate level of data protection. Yeah. So we we have no laws in the US which are equivalent to the to the GDPR. That's different concept in white parts there. Um, and so EU companies have to take certain measures in order to assure that the recipient has some such level of data protection. So there's different measures that can be taken. There's, for example, the um, you know standard contractual clauses. These are standard clauses you know um, um, provided by the EU Commission, uh, which by way of con by way of contract sort of lift up the level of data protection. Um, to a EU level, yeah. So um, what I can say is that the that the recipient in the US or in the third country, um, by way of contract, obliges to certain you know certain requirements, and therefore by way of contract sort of lifts up that level of data protection, yeah. And beyond these model clauses, as a contractual way to providing for an adequate level of data protection um, in the US, there was also the EU US Privacy Shield, which um, was uh, basically a program where, where um, uh, you know U.S. companies could take part and and oblige themselves to com to to comply with certain requirements, and then they were also considered sort of safe, yeah, adequate uh, recipients. 
Um, and um, this has now changed. Uh, the EU US privacy shield was challenged and the European Court of Justice declared it um, you know, um, void. And the interesting thing is the reasoning of the European Court of Justice, because what the European Court of Justice said is that um, there is um, some access rights of US authorities according to US law, also to EU data. Yeah, and there's a lack of legal protection for EU citizens in the US against such access rights. So um, uh, that's the, um, you know, was specific um, US laws, so um, FISA and, you know, some presidential orders. And um, the problem is um, that there's basically, it's a political question. You can basically do nothing against these laws. Yeah, and you can also not by way of contract um, you know, protect yourself um, against these excess rights. Yeah, and uh, therefore, you know, since July, we have to say there's simply no solution about this. Uh, the only thing you, you can do or could theoretically do is basically prevent, try to prevent such, such excess rights of US authorities, uh, simply factual, factually prevent it by way of encrypting your data flows. Yeah, that's basically what is discussed. And this is, I think, beyond a political solution, what you can do is that you try to look for encryption solutions because, you know, having a contract or something like that doesn't help. And uh, that's, I think, very important because um, the, um, the privacy shield is just one measure. So, um, you know, the standard contractual clauses I mentioned before were not invalidated by the European Court of Justice. But basically, it was clear and it is clear that the same issues apply there as well and for binding corporate rules as well. So whatever possibilities you look at, any kind of data transfer is subject to these uh, challenges um, at the moment. And that's basically the issue. Yeah, and the, the laws are exclusionary. I mean, if you're complying with US law, you're not complying with EU law and the other way around. Um, Juan, there's an interesting situation with the uh, um, Spanish Data Protection Authority. Do you want to address that um, a little bit for us? Uh, um, let's say uh, exceptional or, or something to highlight. Uh, what I, I think is, uh, what I can say is that the Spanish Data Protection Agency is quite active. Um, and after this new regulation, it has uh, started uh, a lot of proceedings and, and sanction, uh, and imposed sanction uh, for infringing this regulation to several companies, all uh, significant of the, of, the, of the penalties, but uh, it has been very, very active, um, but the reality is that, as far as I'm aware, and I've been consulting this, uh, the inter international transfer of data to the U.S. is not something that is among the priorities of the Spanish Data Protection Agency. Uh, but I don't know what will be the situation after you know all these new, uh, well, the, the the European Court of Justice uh, decision and and this new this new regulation, which is. Is pretty new, and we will need to know what how it's going to play out in practice. Yeah, and is there any expectation that with a with a new president, um, this will change on the on the U.S. side? Um, Chris, I don't know. I am. My guess is as good as anyone else. I guess on this one. <laughs> maybe maybe. <laughs> <Thank I guess>. <laughs> Yeah, so I think this is pure speculation. Yeah, so uh, yeah. we we don't don't know exactly, and and also maybe to add a few points on 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 the view of the authorities. Yeah, um, so you know everybody's always looking at the data protection authorities, both on a European and a national level, and unfortunately, as I said, you know it's a, it's quite a political question, and they have simply no solution. Yeah, because because there's no solution to limit these rights. And I think this is quite a critical situation at the moment for companies because they all have their data transfers. So many cloud applications um, uh, going on, so many data transfers, and they're all basically subject to these limitations and nobody has a solution. So at the moment, um, the data protection authorities did not start to enforce, yeah, at least in Germany, and I'm not aware of any European enforcements in that regard. Um, but of course, they are telling everybody, yeah, we have no solution, so it's void, you don't, you're not supposed to do it. Yeah, but this is, of course, not a practic practical position. 
Yeah, mm. it's, it's quite, uh, and this is at least in, in Germany, we can say that the data protection authorities to some extent are not, are, are some of the authorities, it's, it's on a, it's, it's, we have state authorities, so it's not, a, not only as an affairs level, some of them are not very realistic, you know, as to, as to how business goes. Um, but even if they were realistic, they had no solution at the moment. So what, what we can recommend our clients is really, and this is what the data protection authorities recommend as well, it is not limited to US data transfers. Basically, you have the same issue you potentially with China, Russia, whatever other country. Yeah, They also have surveillance, um, I'm sure, or I believe at least, they, they may have. And um, the authorities say that companies have to really assess carefully where they have international data transfers to the US, but also to other potential critical countries from a EU perspective always, yeah, and um, assess this and see what access rights may be there and try to address it. But addressing it may always come down to encryption, most likely. So I think this is what companies should really uh, look at, yeah, unless we have a better solution, which may most likely be, be, be a political one. Yeah. Um, just half a second on uh, um, on Brexit in this context, Daniel. Do you do you, do you want to um, say um, anything about um, how that will affect? Yeah. At the moment, we we don't have these issues so far. Um, you know, as um, or at least um, yeah, as long as as we have the full Brexit, yeah, uh, we don't have these issues as uh, the UK is is dealt with like a EU country. Uh, but um, um, after we have the full Brexit, um, then the UK is also going to be a third country, same as Russia, China or the US or whatever other country um, outside the EU. And um, there's a possibility of the EU, which is currently being um, discussed, uh, to have a so-called adequacy decision. Yeah, for some countries, for example, Switzerland, uh, there exists adequacy decision which says, where the EU Commission says, this country has an adequate level of data protection compared to the EU, and therefore you don't have these additional requirements. Yeah? But um, this adequacy decision will not come in place by the end of this year. And then it's quite interesting. Yeah, We will have to deal with the UK like with any other third country. And uh, interesting is that there was a um, European Court of Adjustment, uh, uh, Justice Judgment um, about mass surveillance in the UK, it wasn't, it didn't have much attention. This uh, this uh, judgment, but we have exactly the same issues in the UK, and um, so we may run into a very similar situation where, which of course makes it even more difficult for companies. Yeah. Um, I would like to move on to the restructuring and M&A part of the discussion. Um, Juan, do you want to give us an overview of the topic and um, as highlight some of the differences? Um, between um, US and European um, regulation? Sure, I will do my best. <laughs> um, um, as you know, uh, COVID-19 is, um, is hitting uh, countries in Europe, the, the, the European economy very hard. And most of the countries, I would say all of them, have uh, adopted measures to, extraordinary measures to try to deal with this crisis and to help companies survive. Some of these measures have been already highlighted. Uh, uh, state financing, moratoriums to fight for insolvency, tax deferrals, or, or all, all sorts of measures to or keep or maintain employment um, to the extent possible. Um, in this context, this very challenging context, I think it's absolutely key that uh, uh, European countries have uh, uh, good legislation, free insolvency tools available, that will help companies to, to restructure their debt. So the question is, do we have these tools in Europe? Um, well, the answer is yes. Uh, we do have these tools in many countries, in some countries, like for example, France, Spain, or Italy. But the reality is that we don't have pre insolvency tools in many other countries of the European Union. Um, and, and even the ones we have, the reality is that they are not an, as sophisticated and well tested as the chapter 11 or maybe the UK scheme of arrangement. So the question, the new question would be, are we going to have um, tools that could be in, in Europe that could be comparable to, the, for example, the chapter 11? Uh, the answer is yes, uh, in the short term. Uh, currently, we only have the European Insolvency Regulation, which mainly addresses 
uh, which com which court is competent to deal with uh, an insolvency proceeding, what law is applicable, or coordination rules between between insolvency proceedings. There's not a unique regime affecting uh, establishing principal institutes um, affecting all, all the countries in Europe. Uh, but as I, as I said, we're going to have one in the short term because on uh, July 19, 2019, um, the Directive on Restructuring and Second Chance, and, and Second Chance was enacted. Uh, why this directive was enacted? Well, mainly because the, the Commission realized that uh, the formal insolvency proceedings were not working. They were not really helping companies to, to survive. Uh, and, and, and on the other side, they saw that these insolvency tools that were used in some of the countries were helping really will helping companies to survive. Uh, so when they look at the um, local legislations, to, they, look, they look at the legislations of each country, they realize that many of the countries did not have these tools in place. So they thought that there was a deficiency there and they have to, to address this, this matter. So I'm, I'm gonna go very quickly up, um, with the aims of the directive and the main features of it. Uh, the aims of the directive are mainly four. One, to establish common principles for preventive restructuring mechanisms uh, in, in each uh, EU member state, including Lithuania. Second, to enable companies, on viable companies in a distress situation to have uh, access to effective preventive um, restructuring frameworks that, that help them to keep on operating. Uh, second, uh, sorry, third, to give honest and insolvent or over indebted entrepreneurs the ability to to have a, se a second chance to to, uh, to to obtain a full discharge of their debt in a reasonable period of time and um, four um, to increase the efficiency of restructuring and insolvency proceedings mainly by mainly by shortening them um, as you may know the directive is uh, is quite flexible and gives a lot of uh, well, Room to the to each um, member, state member, uh, European member, to decide uh, how to transpose this directive, but sets out uh, some minimum standards that must be followed. These minimum standards are basically five. If, one, if you want to use these um, these tools, you must be in the vicinity of insolvency. Second, is a debtor in, in possession proceedings like I did normally chapter chapter eleven. Three, you can make use of a moratorium. Uh, this means that even the debtor or the creditors may request a moratorium to prevent enforcement from third parties or mainly creditors uh, that could harm uh, the negotiation. This moratorium could, could go from four months up to 12 months, depending on the circumstances. Four, uh, it includes the concept of, of course, crash cram down in, among Europe, and that's something that we didn't have. In, uh, so it's kind of a change of, uh, of mindset. And five, it uh, incentivizes the member states to have uh, in place safeguards for rescue financing, so that whoever puts money in a distressed situation have some kind of protection if finally the company goes insolvent. Uh, yeah. On that regard, I think. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to ask Anieska on her views about. Uh, rescue financing and how, how important does she, she believes is that to have appropriate safeguards to for for investors I mean I think I, I, I hope you would you would agree with me that uh, access to new new money and and or rescue financing can often be one of the key predictors of the success uh, of a company in in surviving as a going concern so definitely to the extent that the directive provides for protections for new new financing uh, and requires the member states to to protect the new financing from local from um, clawbacks under local law, I definitely think that's important. I I would even go a step further. I think it's it's hard for it, it can still be hard for investors to put in new money into a situation that is troubled. Uh, when that money is put in last in line um, after all of the existing creditors. And I think that may still need to be the case in a lot of the situations, unless you had something like what you had at, what you have in chapter 11, which is uh, a priming lien uh, for new money, 
which allows a new new creditor, new investor to come in and prime the existing creditors as long as it as long as adequate protection is provided. So definitely important and you know and could even still could still be hard even with all the protections in place. Yeah, I was just going to ask what other what is the potential impact on the restructuring and second um, chance directive on US investors? I mean, I think it can pose both both a lot of a lot of new opportunities and and new risks as well that that are uh, sort of as the other side of the coin. I think definitely, as Juan mentioned, uh, not I mean, not the regimes are the restructuring regimes across Europe are are uh, very different and currently, overseas investors tend to come into the European markets th through just a handful of jurisdictions that they're very familiar with that they perceive as predator friendly that's the that's the case today to the extent that the directive is um is successful in expanding that universe of friendly jurisdictions and jurisdictions that that are sort of trustworthy and have predictable outcomes that's absolutely a game changer would be a great opportunity i think would expand the the universe of pathways to preserve and perhaps even create value I um, I would note that that's the the availability of a restructuring um, uh, process is not the only uh, not the only factor that would determine the decision to, to to restructure in a specific country and a lot of a lot of other factors could could come in and be uh, drive that decision including just a more general uh, impartiality of the of the justice system and of the courts and and just quality of legal infrastructure so. There's definitely a wrinkle on that, but I think it's definitely an opportunity. I mean, even for countries that already have very good restructuring processes, I think it still can be a good a good opportunity to to modernize and and revamp their their processes. Not all of them, even countries with very reliable and and very solid insolvency processes, not all have uh, informal pre insolvency processes, and and it's definitely an opportunity to. To address that gap, the the process that the directive uh, contemplates is very is very efficient. Uh, contemplates minimal court oversight, minimal um, and allows to allows the debtor to uh, to address any um, dissenting creditors that might otherwise block the the restructuring. So definitely definitely a lot of opportunities. I, I think. Again, caveat with that, I think it's not without its risks. Any process that's within with minimal court oversight that nonetheless provides for quite uh, expansive uh, ability to uh, limit potentially creditors' rights, I think ha has its risk. It, there could be concerns about due process. There could be uh, concerns about the creditors not having the leverage that they would otherwise have. Uh, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the debtor but but definitely definitely so definitely some opportunities yeah um before i get to um the question if this is going if you expect more litigation to come out of this so uh, um, i mean maybe i read it between your lines um, um the uh, britain leaving the european union that will will have an impact on uh, um on on uh, um how this um, develops don't you think I think that's, I don't know if that was a question for me. I think Juan is probably yeah. the yeah. one to address it. Well, um, the reality is that it's difficult to know. Of course, I think that Brexit and the, these new directives are uh, definitely game changers. Um, maybe the question is when uh, are we going to see those changes, if it's going to be in the short term or in the medium term? The reality is that uh, those um, regimes that have been in place for a long time, like the scheme of arrangement or the chapter 11, uh, um, are no doubt reliable. Uh, they, they are well tested and then, you know, the, the UDSCR system is prepared to deal with them. Uh, and that's something that, uh, you know, the member states will have to work on. Uh, but on the on the medium term or maybe, uh, maybe not, not that far, but maybe soon, sooner, uh, the reality is that uh, if member states are uh, 
they make their, their homework and they, they do a good implementation in the sense that they they offer a good product to whoever may want to restructure it to debt. And 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 even and I would say that those that already have uh, or had sorry um, restructuring uh, proceedings, re re institutes tools in place before this directive was enacted, have, have an, an advantage, and I think they have a, a they could be a, a attractive alternatives because at the end of the day, it's not only to have it is not only important to have a good regulation, but also to to to, to show some experience in, in implementing it and, and and from a pragmatic point of view, you know, timing is, an, is, is is always an issue, and and uh, to have a reliable judiciary system is also a very important as Agnieszka was also pointing out. So, so um, I think that in the very short term, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll have to wait a little bit, but I'm pretty sure that uh, that in the medium term, there's gonna be changes. And uh, um, for example, Netherlands will, uh, I think they, they have the, their schemes will be enforced in this, in, at the start of next year. So uh, it will be a good, we will see how the market reacts when, when these kind of schemes are in place. It will be um, a good proof. Interesting. Um, the, the final thoughts for the, uh, um, for the, for the panelists, and I'm a quick note to, the, to our audience. Um, if you have any questions, do send them in and um, I will feed them into, into the conversation. But do we wanna um, do a quick um, roundabout and ask everybody for, for a final comment on, uh, um, on how all of this will develop? Um, do you, Daniel, do you want to start and then uh, um, Chris? So, uh, yeah, what I can say about, you know, the data protection issues I talked about, um, I, I think in the, in the, this is a certain tendency, you know, um, towards, you know, nationalization, I would say, also in that regard, that everybody wants to protect their data from access by other, by other states. So I think this is a thing we will see in the longer run, and it's mainly a political issue. And um, I think this is where the solution lies, uh, rather than in the details of national data protection law. Chris? Yes, I may just allow to, to come back a little bit on the point also on restructuring. And um, you know, one of the, the, the weakness that was really identified also came out in during the European debt uh, crisis uh, was the um, fragmentation of the capital markets. Uh, fragmentation of capital markets, fragmentation of the banking system uh, in particular, which is still the main way of providing finance in Europe. And, uh, and you know, the idea has always been to try to uh, progressively address this, all these hurdles to, to a more smoother um, capital market. And uh, we have seen a lot of progress being done in, 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 in banking. We still would like to see much more cross-border um, acquisitions, maybe in the banking sector, in order to have that function of the financial sectors as shock absorbers, uh, you know, shocks that come that hit member states or regions set, uh, in a different way to be able to uh, shock absorb not only by the public sectors through next generation EU and such instruments, but also through uh, the private sector. We would like to see it also in the capital markets, and of course, the whole um, discussion on, on harmonization of bankruptcies and restructuring falls into that into that into the picture, uh, just to create create a, a of a more even um, uh, play, uh, playing field, but also sort of moving a little bit the needle in those jurisdictions that tend to be more, you know, uh, creditor friendly or debtor friendly to a more homogeneous, uh, uh, homogeneous space. Uh, um, another part of that, of course, has always been the lack of a safe asset for for the uh, for the EU. Uh, but we that that's where I would like to tie it in with the next generation EU, which uh, you know provides so many answers to different questions altogether in a way. Uh, and of course, here I should not sort of go to, um, you know, stick my neck too, too, too much out. The, it is a temporary instrument, but of course the EU will be the biggest issuer of, of, of bonds uh, uh, over the next the next year, euro-denominated bonds. Uh, and this will have a huge impact also on the, on the capital market and accompany some of the transformation in the capital market union. Huge opportunities for EU, for U.S. firms, I think, you know, both in the financial sector, but also in in all sectors where um, 
EU, uh, US firms have a you know a, a lead because the way this 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 money will be pushed out uh, will create a lot of invest investment incentives for for the private sector and and digitalization. I mean, I think definitely there is a scope and a market that could be interesting for for US firms as well. Uh, of course, remaining mindful of also some of the uh, hurdles uh, uh, that are you know uh, created by different uh, uh, legislation, GDPR being one of them. But um, you know, nothing is uh, unsolvable, I guess. So I would like to leave it on a, on a message of hope on this. Yeah, and in this context, um, we, EACC is hosting a program on December 2nd addressing exactly those opportunities. So um, do visit our website and join us for that. Um, Agnieszka, um, a final thoughts? Uh, final thoughts, I mean, all of, um, all of, all of our discussion today to me just points to um, a lot of new opportunity coming out of this this market disruption um, and you know um, it, it's all very hopeful is <laughs> the general tenor of, of what I've heard today is, is, is there's a lot of um, potential even though we've just been and are still going through a lot of pain I think there's um, a lot of uh, creative ways to address it and a lot of um, uh, value that is coming out of um, the rebuilding in, in new and and um, potentially new, new and, and better ways. Yeah, I think I see the same in the market. Uh, Juan? Well, I think that to summarize, I think that uh, the directive is a, is a good idea um, because they took what procedurally procedurally is working in some jurisdictions and they copy it. And from a substantive point of view, they have uh, also, well, uh, somehow follow the, the route of the chapter 11. So um, we, it, it, is, it is clear that we know what we're doing. Um, it was necessary because there was a deficit in Europe to have uh, these pre service tools in place. And, and, I, and I think there are still some challenges for the future because we need to to decide in Europe how much harmonization do we want for in restructuring? Um, what would be the scope of the formal insolvency proceedings now that we somehow believe that maybe they are not uh, so useful to, to reorganize viable companies? Uh, and three, I think uh, an, an important decision and a difficult one would be how to discriminate between those companies who can use these restructuring tools and which ones not, because uh, at the end of the day, what the commission wants is that only viable companies uh, make use of these tools, not the ones that uh, cannot be really rescued. So uh, a lot is going on. And I think, of course, as Agnieszka just said, there's a lot of opportunities and, uh, and we will have to work a lot to see how things uh, develop in the future. And thank you very much. Thank you. Um, with that, I would like to hand over to Javier Gomez. He's a partner also at Paris Lorca, and he will um, wrap this all into a, into a package and summarize um, some of the findings. Javier? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Yvonne. Well, I, I would like to thank you to all the participants for joining us today. I would uh, like also to thank NER and the European American Chamber of Commerce of New York for the for giving us the opportunity to organize this uh, webinar together but i think it has been very very interesting and it's a privilege to to meet these great speakers uh, at the same event um as a, as a final remark what i would uh, like to say is that in these unprecedented times uh, new regulations in in europe and also in the us uh, are crucial no for for understanding the current situation of the global economy um Talking about the EU recovery package, uh, I think we think it will provide, it, it will try to provide peace of mind to, to European companies and also foreign investors uh, with business in, in the European Union. Opportunities will arise uh, with these uh, new debt issuance and um, probably this will completely reshape the portfolio of, 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 of investors in, in Europe. And potentially in the in the United States. Uh, talking about the GDPR, I think that uh, it's very important uh, to understand the new regulations in the GDPR uh, area and also 
this uh, recent decision that we have been talking about to see how it will impact in the in the European uh, business, also for US uh, investors. And finally, in terms of restructuring, as the panelists uh, mentioned, uh, I think uh, we have highlighted differences uh, of uh, between the Chapter 11 in the US and certain uh, insolvency proceedings in Europe. We have seen that um, uh, other than maybe the scheme of arrangement in the UK, in Europe, there's, there may be a huge difference between different systems on, of, um, of uh, proceedings, insolvency proceedings. So I think it's very important how uh, foreign investors, and in particular US investors, see these insolvency proceedings in, in Europe to see if they are uh, eager to, to go through them rather than go through a Chapter 11 uh, proceeding. And I think that that's all. Uh, I personally hope that uh, we have clarified doubts and we have helped to understand the, the, the current situation in these three main topics. And Ivan, I'll let you the, the floor to finish uh, the, the webinar. Yeah, yeah. thank you, everyone. Um, the, um, thank you to our panelists and to our co-sponsors uh, today, Nor and Perez Loca. Um, this concludes today's webinar. A quick reminder, if you are a member, and you would like to connect to the, any of the attendees um, who joined us for this program, we will make a list of attendees available at the end of the event, and you can reach out to us, and we will be happy to facilitate a connection. With that, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody.